Today I want to talk about international resistance to the death penalty because it's something perhaps many of you may not have thought about and something I certainly would never have thought about when I first started doing death penalty work uh, back in the early 1980s. But um, it has come to pass, and my theme today will be that international pressure has become, along with the domestic pressures that Jim Acker so ably spoke about, uh, that international pressure has become a part of the reason why the death penalty in the U.S. is under so much pressure. And it's something that you may not quite be aware of uh, even yet. But back, way back in the early 1980s, death penalty scholar and lawyer Bill Geimer and I were just chatting. And he said, you know, Alan, the U.S. will never get rid of the death penalty until the rest of the world shames us into it. And I looked at him like he was crazy. Well, he was sort of nuts. This was a period, if you look back upon, that the U.S. had not signed off on very many human rights uh, treaties at all. It didn't obey the ones that it did sign. It had reservations and understandings. And for one thing, it appeared to a, crim a poor little rural criminal defense lawyer like me that the U.S. really didn't care one bit what the rest of the world thought. And so I thought Bill was just sort of out of his mind to even say that or to suggest that international opinion, national pressures would affect the U.S. death penalty. Nonetheless, uh, I think, as I will argue today, Bill was right and I was uh, severely misinformed uh, on the subject. Uh, what I'm going to do is to summarize first some of the general features of resistance to the death penalty internationally. And then I want to use one very narrow example, the notion of extradition. Now, there are a lot of legal issues internationally that we could talk about. Consular relations has been a, an important part of the resistance to the death penalty. And if I have time, we may speak for a few minutes on that as well. And that is a very, very complex issue. But extradition uh, is interesting because cases have come up just within the last week. So it has a kind of currency. Uh, internationally that, uh, that the uh, conventional uh, consular relations stuff doesn't have. Um, so we'll start broadly and then look more narrowly at the kinds of things that um, are forcing the U.S. to consider, reconsider the death penalty. But also it has this other thing that I'm going to talk about, and that is the death penalty is causing problems not just for the U.S. death penalty, but because of the peculiar ways in which international relations are uh, fomented on, on international stage and the way international law has grown, the death penalty has been the trigger point or has been the reason why we have gotten criticism in the last few years on a variety of other things, including torture, including military commissions, including enemy combatant status, including potentially, and this is just rumblings, but potentially in the future, life imprisonment without parole, which is considered a human rights violation in many places, including juvenile prisons, which many countries are very, very critical of the U.S. position, women's prisons. There are a whole host of issues, all of which have come about precisely because the death penalty uh, triggered them and triggered the various exceptions to the law that allowed these other issues to sneak through into the legal analysis in various cases around the world. So the death penalty then has multiple, has created multiple problems for the U.S. and it's not just limited to pressure to abolish the death penalty. Well, First, let's talk about sort of the international price. What you may not realize is that around the world, many, many thousands of people demonstrate in various capitals against execution of, of people in this country. Sometimes cases get international attention because it's an international person, somebody from Mexico or Paraguay or Germany who's being executed. Sometimes these cases come about simply because there's an issue of innocence or racism or something else that, uh, that fires the international imagination. But if it was just people 
protesting the death penalty in Mexico City, which has happened many, many times, or in Germany, or in Great Britain, or other places, that might not affect us so much. But the problem is, is that this is now filtered through to the political establishments, in, particularly in Europe, and in Mexico, and in Canada, and places such as that. And so that what we're seeing is diplomatically, our diplomatic relations and foreign policy becomes harder to, to do just because we have the death penalty. Uh, Harold Coe, legal advisor to the State Department and formerly dean of the Yale Law School, said, important meetings between America and its allies are increasingly consumed with answering official protests against the death penalty. Well, that creates some friction, and clearly international relations don't, uh, and our diplomats don't like to be stopped and bothered by such. But if that were all there were to it, then perhaps we would say, well, that's not so much. But other ambassadors, for example, Felix Rohatten, say no single issue was viewed with as much hostility as our support for the death penalty. Outlawed by every member of the European Union, the death penalty was and is viewed in Europe as a throwback to the Middle Ages. When we require European support on security issues, Iran's nuclear program, which is much in the news now, these days, the war in Iraq, North Korea's bomb, relations with China and Russia, also in the news lately, the Middle East peace process. Our job is made more difficult by the intensity of popular opposition in Europe to our policy. So the death penalty, as you can see, is primarily, as has been pointed out by every speaker today so far, in non-democratic countries, with very few exceptions. And you notice we are bracketed. And this is going to become very important to my talk later when we talk about extradition, the fact that both Mexico, Canada, most of the Caribbean, and much of, of Latin America is abolitionist and will not extradite. So we have these various pressures generally. Now, Mark, you're going to have to show me how to switch this thing. I don't know what you've done here. But I would like to go to the next, uh, next, uh, next slide. Yeah, the next slide, please. Oh, oh, that's how you do. Okay. I think it's kind of. Oh, well, got a lot of pencils down there. I guess they change the slides all the time. I didn't get a screenshot the way Jim Acker did and put it onto a, to a poster. But I, it's my impression, and I don't have scientific evidence to back this up, except to the extent that, uh, as Jim pointed out in his and some of the other uh, talks today, it was pointed out that there have been polls run around the world on opposition to death penalty. And there's a millennium poll that's done every five years, I think, or every 10 years that uh, studies these things. But it's been my impression, having traveled and spoken a lot in Canada on the death penalty and been in Europe and talked on the death penalty and other places, that Europeans and Canadians know a whole lot more about the death penalty than we do. I know some work that Eric Lambert and I did and other people have done and around the country uh, with college students tends to show that Americans, on average, know very, very little about the death penalty. And yet, ironically, we see a lot of knowledge around the world, a lot of people who really study the death penalty and, um, and look at it. Now, there's some reasons for that. Um, if I can scroll this down. There's a very, very bright graduate student at University of Sal of, uh, California, Santa Barbara, and Nicholas Chappelle, La Chapelle, who's done a very interesting study copying or using some instruments that Eric and I created about testing uh, attitudes towards the death penalty. And Eric and I were interested, have been interested in a variety of issues, innocence and um, gender and things such as that. He wanted to test something different. And he said his idea was to test whether or not Americans, whether people in the U.S., would change their opinion about the death penalty if they knew how the rest of the world feels about it. And so he conducted a very, very interesting experiment. With a, it was a convenient sample, so we can't make complete judgment about causation, but it was a fairly large sample, and it was very suggestive and interesting. And what he found was 
yes, Americans do now change their views based upon uh, international opinions and what the international community thinks. And this is something I would never have predicted. And certainly coming from the 1980s, you know, and looking askance at Bill Geimer when he made that kind of claim, I would have never guessed that international opinion would actually materially affect opinions to the death penalty. And then when you look at his data, when you look down into, into this young grad, promising young graduate student's data, what you see is the thing that most affects opinions is the company we keep, the thing that Jim Acker mentioned earlier on that map that he put up showing the company he keeps. Well, if you look at just who is executing, and you look at 2011, you see the US is in fifth place. And if you go down to 2010, we're still in fifth place. 2009, pretty consistently, if you go down, you can see that we're either in fourth or fifth place year after year after year. And the company we keep in almost every case uh, is China, number one, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. Sometimes if you go on further down into the data, you'll see other countries such as Vietnam or Yemen stick, uh, sneaking in there. But year after year, we are in the top 10, and everyone else within that top 10 is an autocratic or dictatorial society that we would not otherwise want to be associated with on human rights issues. And so human rights issues are beginning to affect us uh, around the world. And um, I think this research, uh, which I hope other people will pick up on this research by Nicholas LaChapelle and, and do some more uh, studies of this, because I think it's quite interesting to find out why not only why people hold the attitudes they have, but what will affect those attitudes. Does innocence do it? Does deterrence do it? Does the international community do it? That's something we really ought to know more about. And uh, I'm surprised that nobody until now thought to even test this. It's pretty interesting to me that, that this is the first I've heard of, anyway, of a test of this, of this kind. Um, so let's see. It's also um, something interesting that I think most people don't, aren't aware of is that law enforcement is not nearly so much in favor of the death penalty as you might think. Law enforcement around the world tends to oppose the death penalty, but even in the US, some interesting work that Mike Radelet and others have done studying this have found that a large portion something like two-thirds of law enforcement officers, sheriffs who were asked, said that they did not believe the death penalty deterred or that it substantially reduced crime. Interesting that um, that's the case. So let's now then talk about what I think is sort of where the, the interesting part to me, and that is what are the real legal pressures that come to bear, not just in diplomatic councils, not just um, in protests, not just in attitudes and opinion, but what kinds of things, what kinds of imp uh, impediments are put in the way of the death penalty, and what is the implication, not just for the death penalty, but for our whole criminal justice system when the rest of the world finds mechanisms by which they can affect the US criminal justice system and then to some degree push it. Well, extradition is a legal process of bringing one, a fugitive from one nation to another nation. Usually um, you're trying to get somebody back who's fled a jurisdiction to, to trial in the jurisdiction where the crime has been committed. We have extradition between states, but that's a little bit different because states constitutionally have to sort of cooperate with each other. But on the international level, either you have to have a treaty or you have to have some agreement, or if it's done one-off, you have to do it through diplomats. But you have to have a mechanism, and it's usually a treaty-bound mechanism whereby two nations or a group of nations, such as the European Union and the United States, agree to reciprocally hand over fugitives under certain circumstances. Now, this whole process is an aspect of national sovereignty. 
If you looked at national sovereignty and the way it was viewed from the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 forward to, say, World War II in Nuremberg, it, sovereignty was absolute, it was atomistic. You did not interfere into the domestic affairs of another nation. There were a few very minor exceptions to that, but they were almost, they were so small that um, you almost don't think about them. The uh, European powers at the end of World War I tried to intervene in Turkey to stop the massacre of some of the Christian minorities there. Little things like that happened periodically through history where, where nations did interfere, but it was rare, very rare. Now, one aspect of the notion that sovereignty is atomistic, that you don't interfere, is a notion that of non-inquiry. And that notion is that one nation does not inquire or look into the justice of another nation's criminal justice system before extraditing somebody to justice. You looked at, was the crime committed? Was it a crime in both countries, double criminality? Was it a political crime? Do we have the right guy? Is there enough evidence to suggest that this right guy committed a crime? And once you've asked those questions, extradition was automatic. And it was, you didn't ask what punishments might be imposed. You didn't ask whether the trials would be fair. You asked only those questions. And that was really the last or the strongest bastion of non-interference. If you think about it, although after World War II, nations did begin to look at human rights to a certain degree um, in some areas, the one area that was sacrosanct, the one area where no one looked further was the criminal justice system. Non-inquiry sort of stood out even among uh, that erosion post-World War II as the one place where you didn't look. And so such things as life imprisonment or women's prisons or anything else would have been just with nations were blind to it. Well. That rule of non-inquiry is um, coming apart. And um, let me see if I can get a pick. Do I? Ah, this is what I want. Ah, I'm going to scroll this down. Yeah. I wonder if that, OK, that's as far. I wish I could get a bigger picture of him. Nice looking fella, don't you think? This is. There are bad guys in this world. Even those of us who uh, are considered somewhat on the left have to admit there are bad people in this world. And this guy is really not somebody you want to associate with. He is currently doing time in a British prison for solicitation to murder. He's suspected of a bombing plot in Yemen. He lost his hand and an eye, we think, in probably Afghanistan, although nobody's quite sure. Um, and he's um, wanted by the US. The US has been trying to extradite him since 2005. Now, this should have been a slam dunk even a couple of years, a couple of decades ago. But it's turned into an international zoo, almost, legal zoo, because of the various problems that the U.S. has created itself, beginning with the death penalty. This is exhibit A in what I want to talk about, because this guy um, has gone for seven years fighting extradition in the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom, after a ruling by the European Court of Human Rights finally has agreed to extradite him, and I think he's now in uh, Federal District Court in Southern District of New York um, awaiting trial. So we did get him. That's the good news. The bad news is sort of the road that, that got us there, because he and his several of his cohorts, I think it was five terror suspects, came here 
only after the U.S. State Department, and I've looked at many of these things, the State Department has these pieces of paper and you get them and you evaluate them and I'm usually consulted, uh, you know, as, as to whether or not it's valid and so forth on an extradition. And so when I look at these pieces of paper, what I look for is what did the U.S. give up? And in this case, what the U.S. gave up was quite considerable. First off, it had to agree not to seek or impose the death penalty. Second, it had to agree not to try these people with a military commission. It had to agree that whatever trial they got, they would not be declared an enemy combatant. And we had to assure the United Kingdom that if they were acquitted or if the prosecution for any reason abated, was discontinued, that they would then be allowed to return to the United Kingdom. Now, what's the going on here? What's going on? Well, one thing that's going on is obviously that the death penalty, and we'll talk about how it came to this later, is a part of this, obviously, because of the assurances. But what about these other things? Would they have occurred had it not been for the exception created as to the death penalty? That's one question I will ask as we go through the data here. But there's something else going on. And it's far more troubling for US jurisprudence. And that is this odd language about military commissions and enemy combatants. Now, in Europe, Because of their human rights court and because of the various treaties and protocols that all Europeans have to sign on to and becoming a member of the European Union, they will not send anybody to another nation where they will be tortured. Torture is a big deal. They are really afraid they've gotten caught at it. Now, in many cases, it's pretty easy for them because they can look out in the world and they can look at Human Rights Watch and they can look at our State Department uh, reports on this and they can say that a person, that a country like Egypt or Syria or Morocco is a human rights violator. In Morocco with Benya Mohammed, it's pretty well established that they stripped him naked and took a scalpel to his genitals and cut him up. I mean, that's human rights violation. There's no doubt about it. And Europe doesn't have any trouble saying that. But Europe has a real problem with the US because it's, the US has obviously been a human rights violator, engaged in torture at Guantanamo Bay, had secret prisons throughout Europe, which embarrassed the Europeans tremendously that some of their nations of the European Union were cooperating with the US in torture and were used as way stops for extraordinary rendition where Benjamin Mohammed, for example, was shipped through, um, I believe, a Polish prison, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, ultimately to Morocco where they stripped him and took a scal scalpel to his genitalia. So Europe knows this, but they don't want to say it. So what they've done here with this case, and you can see this is October 5th, so we're fairly recent case. This is not, uh, uh, not going back in history too far. Um, what's happening here is that you can see a couple of things by it. One, they are uh, trying through the back door to eliminate the probability or possibility of torture in the US by saying that he has to be in a civilian courtroom, Southern District of New York, with a real federal judge, that he's got to go to an American prison on US soil, can't go to Guantanamo Bay, can't be an enemy combatant, can't be tried by a military commission, he must be tried fairly, and then that he would be returned to Europe. So that's one thing that's going on. The other thing is, is the implications for the future, which is, of course, that um, if they've come this close to declaring the US a torture nation, um, what's the next case going to look like? And what will it look like when it gets in the hands of a judge? And that brings me to the next case, which most of my friends say I'm crazy to 
read this much into it, but I think I'm not the only one that's going to read this case this way. Um, and I read this case very differently from our U.S. State Department, which reads it very narrowly and as a, as a sort of a one-off. And it's an odd, quirky case. But as you can see, this is even more recent, uh, October 16th. And a computer hacker in Great Britain hacked into some of the um, most sensitive computers in the Air Force, Army, Navy, NASA, Department of Defense, and he got into the most restricted parts of them. So he got into places where it is clearly illegal. And the U.S. tried to extradite him, sought to extradite him to uh, stand trial and uh, under the espionage and other uh, um, criminal statutes regarding these kinds of things. It went up and down and up and down and became a rallying cry in the United Kingdom. And ultimately, the Home Secretary agreed that she would not extradite him to the U.S. and made some noises about maybe prosecuting him in Great Britain, but they don't have the evidence and the odds that he'll be prosecuted there are, are probably a long shot, I would think. But the U.S. State Department is saying, well, this is kind of a one-off. He was uh, threatening suicide. He was depressed. Um, um, maybe this case is just, uh, just sort of a uh, little tar narrow uh, extradition uh, problem. However, the Home Secretary has said that she wants the legislation reviewed and put this in the hands of judges. Now, the basis for not sending to the U.S. was under the fact that the United Kingdom is a signatory to the Convention Against Torture. So he said, well, he's depressed. This isn't real torture. It's, it's torture in an extended sense, maybe. But so what? But notice, it is under the law of torture. So that's a precedent. The US has previously, in all but name, been declared a torturer in the previous case, right? And now we're going to turn these over not to the political authorities, but to a judge on the Queen's bench. Now, the Queen's bench judges, and I can assure you of this, are every bit as good as our judges in our federal district courts. They are really quite, quite capable bench. But there are a lot of judges, both in the federal bench here and the Queen's bench there. And I think it's a matter of time, if it goes to the judges, rather than just to a political appointee, political person, a matter of time before some judge is going to put two and two together and put these two cases together and say, the US is a torturer, and you know we're going to not send people uh, to the US unless we get assurances as to torture and as, unless we can can do that. Well, you say, now what does all this have to do with the death penalty other than the first case there was even assurances? And my point here is that, um, uh, that um, what these cases will do or show or will demonstrate is the broader problem of how the death penalty has been the springboard, if you will. The death penalty has been the way it's sort of the camel's nose under the tent. It's what's pushed things aside, opened the law up, and once the law got opened on non-inquiry, it could no longer be constrained or kept just to the death penalty. So you have a death penalty problem, and you have a broader human rights problem. Extradition is not the only way to demonstrate this, but if I'm going to take a whole lot of time and spend as long on this lecture as, as it's going to take, it's about the only thing I can do is to go through one example and ask you to trust me that this is replicated in all sorts of international legal issues down the line and other things. So let's look at, um, at this broader um, reach. And for that, I think I'll just go back to this. The rule against non-inquiry was absolute in all respects, torture, death penalty, and everything, until 1989. In 1989, a young German son of a German diplomat fell in love 
with a Canadian woman at the University of Virginia. And she was probably a bit psychotic, and he became very dependent upon her, folly adieu, I think the psychologists call it, if I'm pronouncing that right. But in any event, he was so dependent upon her that he would do pretty much whatever she, sa she said. And I, I represented a young man once, Chris Thomas, who was in exactly that same kind of thing. So I know these things do happen. Young men do some pretty stupid things for uh, what they think is love. In any event, um, this young man, Suring, did the same thing my client Chris Thomas did, and he was talked into going down to Bedford County, Virginia, and killed both of her parents, she having persuaded him that the only way to keep them together as a couple was to kill her parents. Now, I realize that's crazy, but that's what happened. He um, and she fled to the United Kingdom, where they were picked up on a bad check charge. The United Kingdom decided to extradite him back to the US. And they sought some assurances, but the prosecutor in Bedford County, Virginia, would only give assurances that he would advise the jury and the judge at the time of trial that it was the wishes of the United Kingdom that he, that these, that he would not be executed. That's about as much of a non-assurance as one could imagine. So having good lawyers, and uh, Suring had a really good lawyer in Gail Starling Marshall, um, brilliant brilliant uh, lawyer, and had some good lawyers in the United Kingdom as well, um, some good barristers. They took the case to the European Court of Human Rights. And the European Court of Human Rights said, you have this treaty that allows you to get assurances, and you didn't get them. And we're not going to set down an absolute rule that you got to get them in every case, but in light of this person's youth, and in light of his mental disability, which would not have been, a, which would have been a defense in the United Kingdom, but which not have been a defense in Virginia, and in light of the death row phenomenon, which is to say the fact that staying years and years and years on death row is in itself considered torture in Europe and in the United Kingdom, and was later held to be so in Pratt versus Jamaica and in. in um, a case coming out of the Privy Council in the United Kingdom. Given all of these factors, the weight of the evidence or the balance is such that you ought to have sought absolute assurances in his case, which in fact happened. And he was went to Virginia, was tried, and was convicted. And Gail Stelling Marshall, the last I heard, is still fighting his case because she thinks he didn't actually kill, get, commit the murders. I must say that in my case with Chris Thomas, um, I don't think he committed both murders. I think he got executed for them. I think he confessed to a crime he didn't commit, but that's kind of an aside. I think that Gail thinks that of his, her client, and she may be right. Who knows? Um, no way to know. But the Suring case was followed by a couple cases in Canada, Ng and Kendler, where the Canadians extradited two people to the US facing the death penalty, one in California, where he faced cyanide asphyxiation, and one to Pennsylvania, where he faced, I think, the electric chair. That case was later looked at by the Human Rights uh, Committee of the UN. They held that the one extradition to uh, Pennsylvania was, was, was valid then under international law, but the extradition to uh, California, because of the cruel nature of, of the punishment of asphyxiation by cyanide, uh, was, was not, should not have occurred. Within 10 years, Canada reversed itself in the Burns case, Raphael and Burns. Um, they had some really good lawyers uh, up in Toronto, including a friend of mine, Lorne Waldman, and Marlies Edward, who fought like just amazing, amazing lawyering in the Canadian Supreme Court. And they got the Canadian Supreme Court to reverse itself. And it held that absent exceptional circumstances, you should always get assurances. So notice the Suring rule is starting to get harder. Now, 
I've been asked to consult on a number of death penalty cases in Canada, and I've taken the position for various reasons that are too complex to go into here in, at a lecture, uh, that the rule in fact in Canada is in fact absolute. And Lauren and Marley's and others have argued that in extradition cases successfully to the Minister of Justice, and thus far we haven't had to test it because the Minister of Justice has agreed with us that they've got to get assurances in every case before Canada will extradite to the U.S. So notice one thing that's happening. The death penalty assurances, the rule against non-inquiry, non which started as this sort of flabby balancing rule in Suring, has become harder. But it's gotten harder than that because um, South Africa, which is a really interesting country and has a very, very powerful, strong constitutional um, court with some of the world's best jurists, Albie Sachs and Richard Goldstone have been on that court, a very distinguished court. And as good a court as you'll find anywhere in the world. And the opinions are, are just impeccably written. That court faced a really interesting case involving an Al-Qaeda agent who had been involved with blowing up the embassies at Dar es Salaam and Nairobi where hundreds of people were killed. These are U.S. embassies that got attacked by Al-Qaeda long before 9-11. And one of the Al-Qaeda agents was found in Germany where assurances were given. And once those assurances were given, he was shipped to the Southern District of New York where he could only be tried uh, and held for life. He could not face the death penalty. South African officials deported didn't extradite, they deported him, not to his homeland, uh, which I think was Mozambique, if I'm not mistaken, but in any event, that doesn't matter. They deported him to the US. Now, South Africa officials here have clearly violated a, very, a variety of their own laws on technical grounds, but the South African Constitutional Court was not content to leave this on technical, legal, formal grounds. It ruled as a matter of urgency that deportation, export, extradition, doesn't matter what you call it, what legal remedy is involved, you must always get assurances before you can take somebody from South Africa to, the, to a death, to a country where they face capital crime. And that opinion was faxed immediately to the court so in the Southern District of New York which then had to, under the law, tell the jury of this because you'd have one defendant who can get the death penalty and another who get, and didn't. And so the opinion goes before the jury of the South African court in an American court saying that the South Africans did not want uh, the death penalty in this case and that it shouldn't have occurred. The jury came back with life imprisonment for both uh, individuals. So. And the South African, you say, you know, a lot of us don't seem to think about Africa and African courts like that, but the South African court is, particularly in the Commonwealth of Nations, extremely influential. It's a very important court. So this is a very important opinion. And notice the death penalty is getting, uh, the, the issue is getting harder and harder uh, against uh, the U.S. Uh, European Union has renegotiated the extradition treaty with the U.S. and they now have it in treaty law that it is absolute. That has other consequences. The U.S. has typically permitted kidnappings under a variety of doctrines. It, they have said that if you can't get somebody any other way, you can kidnap them, bring them to the U.S. and try them. But that line of cases has an exception, and that exception is where, except where the treaty prohibits it. If a treaty prohibits it, then you can't go in and kidnap. And Europe uh, made sure after that line of US cases to put in its treaty language that uh, the US would not kidnap, could not kidnap, and that it would have to resort to extradition as to Europe. So what about Mexico? Well, Mexico is the same way. They absolutely will not extradite to the U.S. Most of Latin America, South America, 
ha does not have the death penalty. So the U.S. is, you can see, where most criminals are going to flee, if they're, and particularly if they're facing capital punishment, is going to be a state where they can't get extradition. Um, I had a client once who was on death row. He was part of the great death row escape, the biggest escape uh, from death row ever, I think. And he got as far as three miles of the Vermont border. And some of us wonder what would have happened if he had gotten three miles further and had set up a test case. But we'll never know, because they captured him and executed him. But in any event, the rest of the world is pushing hard against us in the extradition realm. Um, you might ask, uh, well, what if we just gave assurances and then reneged on it? And Attorney General Ashcroft attempted to do that uh, some years ago. And the, the, I think it was Jack Weinstein in the Southern District of New York slapped that back pretty uh, quickly. I, the courts are pretty clear, I think, that if once you've given your word internationally on an extradition, you have to keep it. Um, now, there is some case law to the Ninth Circuit, which really bothers me, particularly when I'm consulting on these issues, because um, it really narrows that ambit. It says that these extradition um, um, agreements have, will be strictly construed, and they take a very formalistic view. And if you don't put it in writing exactly as you want it, you don't get it. And you can't have anything implied, um, even if it's perfectly obvious that the other nation um, had limited you. So there are some problems here, but if you give your agreement, you ultimately have to, to abide by it. And one would presume most nations now are getting sophisticated enough to where they're not going to, um, to uh, make a mistake on that issue. So what we're seeing now then is another thing going on. Before this new treaty of Europe, Spain and several other nations, Mexico is another one, didn't like life in prison without, without the possibility of parole, thinking it a human rights violation. And so they, several nations, attempted to refuse extradition uh, in, in the so-called LWAP, or life ca imprisonment cases. That has ended. I think both the European Union and Mexico realized that that was going to be a problem for them that they would have fugitives coming, and then what are they going to do with them if the US doesn't give assurances? And so Mexico's uh, constitutional court, its Supreme Court, reversed itself on that. And the European Union put in to its treaty that it would extradite. And the death penalty was the only thing. But notice, torture has now been coming in. And not just in this recent case. There, I could, uh, there have been a number of cases out of Germany uh, in the last 10 years where they refused to extradite if we were, um, were going to use a military commission or declare somebody an enemy combatant. Um, there's been a lot of uh, thought about um, not extraditing uh, in some of our drug cases. So thus far, Canada has allowed those extraditions, and the Canadian Supreme Court has allowed it. But there's been a lot of unhappiness in Canada with extraditing back to the US to face the harsh uh, drug sentences that we face. So the, what's happened is, is that the rule of non-inquiry, which was so absolute, got broken open by the death penalty. And now other kinds of cases are starting to sneak through, because it's not a rule that you can suddenly limit to the death penalty. It leads itself to questioning human rights violations of all kinds, including torture, including women's prisons, including juveniles, including all sorts of other things, um, some of which have occurred. And some of this, obviously, I'm merely speculating on. But it is nonetheless becoming a real problem for our criminal justice system. And it's the death penalty that has been the trigger for that. Now, where you end up on human rights, you may think this is a good or bad thing, but it is certainly at least a fact that that's what is happening in the extradition realm. The other thing that is happening is that extradition gets much more difficult. It becomes much less pro forma, much more expensive to get somebody back from Canada. If every case is going to have to require assurances, going through the State Department, 
approved by State Department lawyers. Then it's going over to Canada where Minister of Justice lawyers are going to look at it. And then they're going to get lawyers like Lauren Waldman and Marley's Edwards looking at it, at the, at the missive. And then they're going to ask someone like me to look at it. And then they're going to maybe litigate it, sometimes all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court. Well, then you can see that uh, extradition becomes a long, cumbersome process, something that's supposed to be rather quick and matter of fact and happens within a few weeks now takes years or can take years, particularly given the, if the issues uh, are right and if there are things to be litigated in Canada or Mexico or wherever. So that's another problem that you have. This has placed real problems for the war against terror. Um, and it's in combination with other things. Because notice that when you want to get a terrorist, and I showed the case of Abu Hamza um, earlier, it took us, what, seven years to get him finally, and then with assurances as to all sorts of things. But the war against terror is becoming uh, circumscribed in a variety of ways. Now, it's not just extradition that's the problem. It's extradition in combination with the fact that extraordinary rendition has been shut down because European nations will no longer cooperate, having gotten caught doing it uh, earlier. It's because our secret prisons in Europe have gotten shut down. Um, so the US has to look more and more towards extradition. I don't know if you all saw the Washington Post the day before yesterday, but there's a long, long expose uh, about the use of drones and intelligence and in what we do with people abroad. And of course, extradition is one component of what you do when you're trying to deal with terrorism. And that component becomes very difficult. And it becomes even more difficult if nations see the US as a nation that engages in torture and unfair military commissions and trials and won't extradite because of that, or will, as in the case that I cited, um, will um, require uh, assurances. And seven years, I, I put it to you that seven years to get somebody who's a really bad guy, I think, um, <laughs> uh, seven years to get somebody and all of the millions of dollars that it must have taken to run that extradition through all of the courts of Britain and all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights and back, uh, that is an amazing amount of effort, energy, and money for one or two terrorists. And it certainly puts a crimp on things when you have to go to that extreme to, to get people. Um, so the other thing is that it is, is these, these legal issues don't come in isolation. They, they, they get connected in ways. If you notice that if extraordinary renditions become impossible, or at least so hard that it's the one-off situation. And if extradition has become more and more expensive, and your secret prisons are more expensive, what do you do? Well, one of the things that we're doing is we're picking people up, kidnapping them, and putting them on warships out in international waters. Now, I put it to you, that cannot be cheap. <laughs> It cannot be simple, and it cannot be a long-term solution to our problem. So the death penalty has caused all sorts of problems down the line in all kinds of ways that most people never even think about or even consider what the problems are that come from international opposition to the death penalty. Now. Um, I'm just about finished, but I do want to say just a word about some of the other things that I hinted at, Vienna Convention on Consular Relations and Consular Relations, because that also is a huge problem for us. Under the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, Article 36, every nation is required when a person is picked up, a foreign national is picked up, to tell that foreign national that he has a right or she has a right to consult with their consulate and get consulate advice and help. And the US 
typically fails to adhere to its obligations under the VCCR, under the Consulate Relations Act. So ask yourself, if you were in Paraguay, or you were in Mexico, and you didn't speak the language very well, and you were picked up for a crime, what's the first thing you would want? You'd want somebody from the consul coming there and getting you a lawyer, right? So if a consulate's not doing it, then, and it's not doing it in almost every case, then there's a real problem because of, there's a lack of reciprocity here, isn't there? If Paraguay is telling people of their rights and the US isn't, what's Paraguay's incentive to do it right? keep giving people their rights. So your safety abroad becomes compromised by the US failure to, uh, to adhere to its own treaty. And this has become so serious that multiple secretaries of state have tried to get states to comply. And the case has gone to the Supreme Court a couple of times in the US and all the way to the International Court of Justice from time to time. And without going into the decisions, they've all gone against the US in the international fora. Our Supreme Court held, well, we don't have to obey the international fora. It's up to the states. Texas has said it will not obey. Oklahoma and Nevada have both said they will obey the Havana Convention and will give people their rights. And if somebody's on death row, they will give them a rehearing of some sort. But Texas won't. So what does all of that mean? Well, among other things, it makes the death penalty that much more difficult to prosecute, at least against foreign nationals. It's one more reason why foreign nationals demonstrate against us in foreign capitals. It's one more reason why foreign diplomats make things hard for us, because their nationals, who might be German or Mexican or Canadian, are in the dock. And so you have this whole notion of consular relations coming in and Mexico in particular, but not just Mexico, but Mexico's had more nationals on US death row than anyone else, has set up a capital clearinghouse. So now if one of you out here gets charged with a capital crime, depending on where you are, you'll have a public defender who may or may not be good. But if a Mexican comes up and, and is charged with a capital crime, they're going to get a good lawyer because Mexico's going to pay for it. And so you've got the Mexican Capital Clearinghouse getting involved in, and they have been very effective because it turns out that often there are defenses to capital crimes. Often with a good lawyer, you can win the case. Often if you've got a good lawyer, you can at least coming up with mitigating circumstances so that you don't get the death penalty. And so they've been, and often even in post-conviction, if you get the right lawyer, you can get the case turned around. As Jim Acker was saying, the Liebman study shows a remarkable uh, rate of appeals turning some of these cases around. And so having the Mexico, having a capital clearinghouse is another big thing that is in the way of the death penalty and foreign pressure. And finally, this is the last thing I'll say before I open it up to questions. I got consulted on the Ronald Allen Smith case up in Montana, and that was an interesting thing. And there's another way in which governments can uh, affect and make things more difficult for the U.S. It turns out that Ronald Allen Smith is Canadian on Montana's death row. And so Canadian officials, consular officials, were um, doing what they should do, which is they were giving him clemency services. They were arguing to the governor that the governor could commute his sentence and possibly even allow him to serve his time in Canada because there's a treaty allowing Americans to serve their time in the U.S. if they've committed a crime in Canada and vice versa. And so there's a treaty governing this process that, that would allow that to, to go back and forth across the border. And so Ronald Smith could, in theory, you know, go to Canada if the governor would allow it. Well, and, and commute the death penalty. Well, the conservative government in Canada got wind of this because it was reported in the National Post in Canada by, and Can West by a very enterprising reporter. And the Canadian government says, well, we're no longer going to intervene in capital cases in democratic countries with good judiciary. Well, you can imagine the problem that's created in Canada. First off, Canadians had people on 
facing capital crimes in China and Saudi Arabia. Now, did China or Saudi Arabia want to hear, oh, the U.S. is good guys, so that's why we're not doing intervening there, but we're intervening here because you're bad guys? Does that sound like good diplomacy for, to you? That, that was a problem for the Canadians. But then they got sued. Lorne Waldman, Marley's Edwards, and Craig Forsees, and some other very, very fine lawyers sued the Canadian government, and the Federal Court of Canada ordered them to reinstate consular services. So now what we know is that not just Mexico, but Canada will henceforth aggressively in intervene in these cases and, do, and provide consular services right up uh, till the very end um, in these cases. And so the Ronald Allen Smith case is just one more example of what, in isolation, seems like a tiny little thing. And if you look at everything I've talked about, and, I, and the, you know, we could stand here for hours and talk about other things, but if you just look at the tiny little things, they're all small. And none of them by themselves would result in major pressure to end the death penalty. Nor am I saying that international pressure is going to be the driving factor. I think, uh, as I'm sure Jim does, that domestic factors such as innocence play a larger role. I think that uh, racial and, and maladministration of the death penalty plays a larger role. But what surprises me, and what shocks me even, particularly in the, tw the since 1980, however many years that is, I guess it's 30 some years, isn't it, that I've been doing this work, is how much the international community has come to count. And it seems to me it can only come to count more on the death penalty. And because of the death penalty, other human rights issues also become a problem for the U.S. So that's my message for today. The international uh, law is a whole lot more important than I would have ever realized. And those people who say that there is no such thing as international law, I think, really don't quite understand where the game is being played now. Questions? All I see is people taking notes. <laughs> Yes. You were talking uh, just recently about how the U.S. is going against its own treaty or whatnot. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, the purpose for the Vienna Convention, well, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations is a broad based treaty that talks about citing of consulates, accreditation of consuls whole wide smear of things. It's only this one article which says that if Jim Acker here is charged with murder in Paraguay that the police have got to come and tell him you have a right to a consular assistance do, and ask. You know, he doesn't have to do it. Now, if, if Jim is on the lam from something in the U.S. and doesn't want, <laughs> want to be the constant to know he's there, okay, he, he has the right to, 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 to turn that down. But the point is that everyone has the right to at least be advised, told of their consular rights. And what has really made uh, nations upset about this is, the, is not just that the U.S. is not obeying it, but the way in which it fails to obey it. Because what happened in some of the cases, Angel Breer, the first one out of Virginia, he, Angel Breer was from Paraguay. He didn't know anything about the Vienna Convention. His lawyer knew nothing about it. His court-appointed lawyer knew nothing about it. Virginia held that because they didn't raise it, it was procedurally defaulted. That is, it wasn't raised in time, and therefore it could never be raised. And Virginia had the harshest procedural default rule in the country. 21 days after trial, well, it, it's even worse than that. If you didn't raise it at trial, it, it might be time, and deemed untimely. But if anything, 21 days after trial and you're done in Virginia. So other nations look at that and say that the U.S. is allowing a very technical rule that isn't even a part of the law in most other countries to trump a very important right. So they see this as a human right and the Vienna Convention as a human right and as an important check and balance on, on making sure that their foreign nationals get a fair hearing and a fair trial. And procedural default becomes a really irritant because people, if you're in Canada, in Canada if you fail to raise something, 
There is no such thing as procedural default. Canadian courts will look at it and say, well, did your lawyer not do it for strategic reasons? How important was it? Could it they will ask a whole bunch of questions about whether or not it could have affected the verdict. And then they'll decide on the balance of all of these factors whether or not they should grant the appeal or not. The US is, is so far as I know, the only country that has this rigid rule that cuts things off. And other nations can't understand that. And they see this as a real human rights violation, a real fair trial violation. And they see a really niggling technicality trumping fundamental human rights. So that's, it, I guess I didn't make myself clear at the beginning. I'm trying to go so fast and not talk about all the Vienna Convention cases. Um, but it, it's, a real, it's a real hot issue and a real bone of contention. And this is why diplomats really dig in on the US. And, and this is why it, it leaches out to other issues, such as nuclear disarmament, or Iran, or Iraq. Because we may not think it's such a big deal, but that's not the important point. These diplomats in these other nations think it's a big deal, and they see it as a human rights violation, and they then dig their heels in. Questions? Yes? Well, I, I have the sense, and I'm not, you know, I'm not involved in the routine mundane extradition cases. <laughs> I, I'm not involved in uh, somebody who's picked up wanted for auto theft in, in, and is caught in Canada. My sense of it is those things are pretty routine. Where it gets hard, death penalty, torture, terrorists, military commissions, and to a lesser extent, but it's lurking in the background, drug sentencing, where we have life imprisonment for crimes that other nations either don't consider criminal or consider a relatively few years in prison, as opposed to life without parole. Uh, those kinds of cases are where, 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 it's, where it's gotten enormously complicated. That's right. Okay. Um, is that sentence suspended during the extradition process? No, 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 no. I th I, yeah, he's serving the time. They're not going to, trust me, the British are not crazy. They don't want this guy. <laughs> it, is, it has become a problem. For one thing, he's had some pretty good lawyers, I think we'd have to agree. Some pretty good barristers, and they have pulled out all the stops. And they've argued a lot of things that he didn't get. They argued the torture issue and, and, and all strongly. And as I said, I think the, the way the European court got around it was to, to not ever mention the word torture, but just sort of put all the rules in that would prevent torture. And if I'm right in that reading, and if I'm right in the reading of the other case with the computer hacker, then these demonstrate how the death penalty has almost spread out into all these other areas in ways that no one could have predicted in 1989 when the Surin case first came about. I certainly wouldn't have predicted, and I bet you Jim would admit he wouldn't have either. <laughs> yes, Sandy. It seems to me that it, 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 there is this war on the Supreme Court that we Well, no, they, it's interesting because let's just take the example of the uh, Vienna Convention that I've raised. Um, the World Court held in Avena that the U.S. had violated the treaty, that Avena had individual rights and had standing to raise the issues up on his own apart from the Mexican government, and that the courts had to provide a remedy, and that gubernatorial clemency proceedings were insufficient. 
Another case came up later, Medellin, which, which goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, we're not going to pay any attention to the World Court. Well, what happens after that? George Bush, the president, writes a letter to Texas ordering him, basically ordering Texas, that they should comply. After Avena. And then, so, and before that, in the Breard case, Madeleine Albright implored Virginia to comply. Texas said no, Virginia said no. But in a majorly courageous opinion, the Tories case out of Oklahoma, Oklahoma said, we need to obey international law, and we're going to provide a remedy. Now, what that remedy is may vary from state to state, but the fact that they're going to comply with international law at a state level is quite significant. And now, just within the last month, I think, or two, Nevada, and I think it's the Gutierrez case. Am I pronouncing that right, anybody? Anyway, Nevada has become state number two to, uh, to comply. And so we see international pressure having little tiny interstitial effects here and there on states. We also see that that will ha may have an effect on the procedural default rule because Oklahoma and Nevada both waived the procedural default rule and so that becomes a part of the common law which may get cited by other cases. So you see little things there. Um, there was a case in Kentucky some years ago where the prosecutor was just bent to get the death penalty, and the person was found in Costa Rica. And finally, the State Department went to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor publicly says in the local paper there in Kentucky, well, we're going to have to assure that the death penalty is not imposed in this case because we're not going to get this guy if we don't. So that's, those little things are replicating themselves through the country. We have extradition matters that hit in a particular county with a particular prosecutor, or you have a Vienna Convention case that hits in a particular place or a particular county. But they do, they, the international law does filter down. It, because the Supreme Court has rejected um, the convention, it's sprinkling down in a sort of a piecemeal fashion but that doesn't mean it, that it, that battle won't continue to be fought. And let me tell you this. When I first started trying death penalty cases and I saw the Breard case, I thought it was just weird, you know? I thought, this is just crazy, you know? I could have predicted the way the Virginia Supreme Court and the Supreme Court went holding procedural fault, and I didn't think much more of it. And, I, you know, and Bill Geimer and I were talking about this case, and I, oh, come on, Bill. You're just... You're just an ivory tower academic. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> and, you know, I've, had, I've since had to talk with Bill and said, Bill, you know, you were right. Yeah. And you, you look at these little things and you say, well, they're just tiny. But they're, every year, every time, you get something that's bigger or something that's more. And so I see, a, you know, I see something that looks like, to me, a trend. And if you, if you, and, and like as Jim said, if you look back far enough, if you go back to Angel Breard's case, and you look where we are now, and the way international law has filtered down to various things, we've come a long, long ways. If you look at it from the other way, it, is, is international law really affecting death penalties the way innocence or some of these other things? Well, of course not, no. I'm not, I'd never make that claim. But I would make the claim that it's having an effect, yeah. Oh, yeah. Any more questions before we head out? Yeah. Uh, look, what role does uh, corruption play in some of these countries? Like what we have in the human rights violations? Uh, even though uh, I noticed that you've uh, been victim of purple. Uh, oh, well, yeah, they are. <laughs> right. Abolitionist. Uh, Well, a lot depends upon which nation you're talking about and the degree to which they have adhered to the uh, American uh, covenant on civil and political rights and whether or not they adhere to the jurisdiction of the uh, 
of the uh, Human Rights Court of the American, uh, of the, Amer the Human Rights, I'm not getting the name right here, I'm blanking at the moment, but the, the American Human Rights Court. And those nations that have uh, started doing that, like Honduras and so forth, the human rights record's getting a lot better in Latin America. And I think Latin America, many of us sort of have an, an old and antiquated ideas. I went down for the consulta after the Zapatista revolution in um, 1994. And some of the things that I heard and saw and some of the torture and the bodies and, and things that I saw in pictures of stuff was just horrific. And that was 1994. And I don't think that's going on now. So are there human rights violations in Mexico? Well, there are human rights violations in the United Kingdom, too, and in Canada and Sweden. We could talk about Sweden one of the greatest human rights nations in the world, and yet they conspired with the USCIA to send two, pe Egy two people back to Egypt where they were brutally tortured. So if you want to talk about human rights violations in Latin America, fine, but let's be clear, they're a lot better than they were. They've improved a tremendous amount. We have our own violations here. We have enough with extraordinary rendition and torture and waterboarding that we don't need to go complaining too loudly about somebody else's house. And so, yeah, human rights violations in Latin America, sure, there are some, sure. And, and I'm quite certain that they persist. But I'm, I'm not as concerned about that as I would have been, say, in 1994. When I was down there for the consulta and you saw those granaderos marching by, it really put chills down your back, particularly if you were in the line of where they were marching. And I don't think you'd say that now in the streets of Mexico City. I think you could walk the Socolo uh, pretty uh, safely now, my guess is, without, uh, without any fear whatsoever. Any further questions? Are we thinning out? Oh, Wayne, I know you must have a question. No? <laughs> Since when have you not had a question for me, Wayne? Yes. <laughs> U.S. is well behind. You ought to ask Michael Mensch on this more so than me, and our, our speaker, next speaker, uh, is on restorative justice. But my, I've spent a lot of time in Canada, and with, particularly with the native communities up there, and if you look at native communities of Hollow Water, which is an Anishinaabe community, the, uh, the principles of restorative justice are really, really ingrained there. And in fact, the Crown Attorney goes up and consults with the community before they even, on even very serious incest and spousal abuse cases and, and serious, serious cases are handled right there in the Hollow Water community. And it's a model for the rest of the world. We had Howard Zier here at our conference a few years ago, and he was a consultant on that project. And so if you look to New Zealand, where the Maori um, communities are very active in restorative justice, you will see that in the U.S. is really quite behind in, in some of these things. But I'm not the expert. I think if you come to this afternoon, uh, or if you ask Michael Mensch, you can ask somebody who has, knows a lot more about it than I do. But I, we have the movie Hollow Water here in our library. And if I could make one thing about restorative justice to see, see that movie, in part because the acapella, the male acapella voice, and, and I can't duplicate it because I can't hold a tune in a bucket, but he sings, he sings repeatedly a cappella, miigwitch, gitchi manitou, miigwitch, gitchi manitou, miigwitch, gitchi manitou, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you. And it's just stunning. I mean, just chills go up and down my back when I hear this native, native person singing that. And the rest of the movie's good, too. <laughs> it's a wonderful movie. So check it out. We have it. It's in our library. You should, you should look at it. Are we out of time? Well, good. Thank you.